following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Today, our lecture is going to cover the topic of meditation. As we have moved through the discussion of the various qualities of consciousness, also called paramitas in Sanskrit, we today arrive at the fifth. So to remind you, So to set the context for this very important paramita, we will quickly review the ones that led up to this. The first, of course, is usually called generosity or charity. And in its essence, generosity is the aspiration to develop bodhicitta. And as you recall, bodhicitta is a combination of two things. The term means awakening mind, or mind of wisdom, or even wisdom heart. But bodhicitta is composed of two elements, compassion or conscious love, and the realization of emptiness the understanding of emptiness. The second paramita is usually related to ethics or discipline. The third is forbearance or patience. The fourth is zeal or diligence or activity. The fifth is usually called concentration or meditation. But for this one, I want to refer to the Sanskrit term, which is dhyana. And that's spelled D-H-Y-A-N-A. It's a Sanskrit word. And so the sixth paramita, or the, the, the ultimate conclusion of the development of all these conscious attitudes is prana, which is another Sanskrit term. And prana is spelled P-R-A-J-N-A. You'll hear a lot of variations in how to pronounce this word. Um, prajna, prana, prajna. So there's some disagreement about how that J-N-A sound is made, but commonly it's nya. This relates well to sounds that are not common in English, but are common in other, particularly Asian languages. So prana is usually translated as wisdom. And of course, we have to point out that wisdom in Hebrew is chokmah. And as you know, chokmah is the Christ.
If you've studied Buddhism, then you've undoubtedly encountered the basic postulate of Buddhism, which states that enlightenment arrives because of a combination of two things. Method and wisdom. Method is the practical means, the actual steps, the actual work that any person has to perform in order to arrive at enlightenment or liberation, freedom. Method is comprised of the first five perfections or paramitas. Wisdom is the sixth. So enlightenment or liberation comes about because of method and wisdom. Dhyana, meditation, is the highest aspect of method. In other words, physical action, charity, performing seva or service, karma yoga, doing selfless acts like giving to charities or donations or doing other types of activities, all of those things are inferior to meditation. Let me repeat. The four lectures that we've given up till now about the paramitas have encompassed a wide range of conscious attitudes and conscious activities. Generosity, donations, giving, charity, methods of self-discipline, methods of developing patience, and methods of activity through diligence. But all of those are inferior to meditation. In fact, all of those Endeavors, those conscious attitudes, find their expression ultimately through dhyana or meditation. In other words, in order to know how to truly be generous, to embody bodhicitta and really become a bodhisattva, you need discipline of yourself to control the forces that oppose generosity. I mean, that's our ego. Pride, anger, lust, gluttony, envy, etc. We need self-discipline to control the mind. But that self-discipline is not enough because when those elements arise in the mind, they create conflicts, problems, suffering, difficulties, karma. Thus, we need patience. We need the third paramita. We need enough endurance to withstand those ordeals. But even that's not enough. Even withstanding those ordeals, we can, we can be sitting still and just holding the pain, holding the suffering. That doesn't really transform the situation. Action does. Gnosis is lived in action, says Samael and Vior in the Revolution of the Dialectic. That's why we need the fourth paramita, which is diligence. Effort, action, activity. But even that isn't enough. Because to know how to act is very difficult when we're trapped inside the ego. When we're trapped inside of our own wrong sense of self, the mistaken view that we have about who we are, about what our identity is, then we have the tendency to behave in the wrong way, to create karma, to create suffering. The only way to separate from the ego is through meditation. Is through the method. That separation in Sanskrit is called samadhi. S A M A D H I. Samadhi is a state of the consciousness in which the free consciousness, the Buddha in nature, the essence, is extracted from the ego, is no longer conditioned by desire. And in that state, can perceive clearly, can perceive the true nature of existence. That true perception is prana, wisdom. 
And of course, we arrive to that in levels, by stages, by work. So these paramitas fit together in a very important structure. It's essential for us to understand that. A good symbol, an embodiment of that teaching, is in the way that Tara, the Divine Mother, is usually represented in Tibetan art. Tara is the goddess, the Divine Mother. And her name means she who saves, or the savioress. Tara was born or manifested from the tears of the cosmic Christ. The story goes that when the cosmic Christ was observing the sufferings of all the beings in the realms below, which are all the realms on the tree of life, he felt so much compassion that he shed tears. And from those tears sprung Tara, the goddess of compassion. She is the mother of all Buddhas. And what that means is that it's from this root compassion, bodhicitta, that every Buddha that exists emerges. Every Buddha that has ever come to be, that is becoming to be now, and that will arise in the future, is born from Tara, compassion. But her symbol is typically where she's seated, and her left leg is folded like a meditation posture. And her right leg is extending out as if she's going to leap into action. She's a mother. And she loves her children. And we are all her children in development. The left leg, which is folded, symbolizes prana, wisdom. And it's wisdom that arises from meditation, which is why the leg is folded there. It's something that arises from practice. The extended leg is method, action. Both of these elements, method and action, method and wisdom, are born from bodhicitta, from loving kindness, from comprehension of the absolute. So meditation, this fifth perfection or conscious attitude is essential. And this is why meditation is constantly reinforced and discussed in our tradition. That's why we always point to meditation. We always indicate meditation. The tradition that we're studying in these lectures we call gnosis. And as you know, gnosis is a Greek word which means knowledge. But this wisdom is not unique to one time or place. It's extremely ancient and has its presence in many places on this planet and beyond. The particular teachings that we study in this day and age, in this time, are those related to Samael and Vior. And Samael and Vior is a great lama, is a great master, who taught his wisdom according to the needs of this time and place. So his teaching is very sophisticated and very potent because we need that. All of the elements that he taught are important. Being a bodhisattva, being a, a, an entity, a conscious intelligence that understands the nature of suffering, but particularly in this time and place. He taught specific elements necessary for us to comprehend in order to conquer suffering. Therefore, there's nothing useless in his teaching. There's nothing for us to disregard. The entirety of the teaching is important. It's very important for you as a student to grasp this. Oftentimes when we study the books of this tradition, we find things that are hard for us to grasp. 
or that we don't understand. And so we tend to skip those things or disregard them. And unfortunately, this is also the case with certain schools or instructors in this tradition who neglect to teach aspects of the teaching which are critical. In particular, I want to talk about wisdom, emptiness, prana. Prana is the comprehension of the absolute. We're going to talk in detail about that in the next lecture. But if you look at the books of Samael Anvior, you'll discover he discusses the nature of the absolute and emptiness in all of his books. And some of the books, he begins there. For example, the book Cosmic Teachings of Lama. This book starts with discussion of the absolute. And that indicates its importance, that the understanding of the entire book rests in the understanding of that first chapter to comprehend the nature of shunyata, emptiness, prana. <clears throat> As a side note, we can discover within his teachings all of the schools are synthesized. All of the three vehicles that we've discussed, Shravakayana, Mahayana, Tantrayana, those all are synthesized in his teachings. Nothing is left out. It may not be explicit, but the teachings are there. And this is because his teaching encompasses the entire path, not just one part or another. When we talk about meditation, we're talking about the cultivation of a particular kind of conscious attitude. The word meditation is really misused in the West. Um, when, when the teachings from Asia began to arrive in the Western world, the people who were involved with translating that knowledge and bringing that knowledge to the Western mind used this word meditation in place of a whole variety of words from Tibetan or Sanskrit. So because of that, Western students who've adopted this concept of yoga or Buddhism or Hinduism have in their mind meditation, but it's a very imprecise term in the mind of Westerners. There's not a clear understanding of different aspects of meditation. In Gnosis, we need to understand that. We need to analyze the actual terminology and experience it. We have to arrive at our own experience of the differences between all the terms and states of consciousness because this is dependent, our very development is dependent on it. Our very realization, our liberation depends upon us understanding our own consciousness. In Buddhism, the teachings of the Buddha present meditation as having two fundamental aspects. The first aspect is called shamatha in Sanskrit. Shamatha simply means calm abiding or mental peace. And shamatha refers to a state of psychological equilibrium within which the attention can be focused without distraction. And this is a state of concentrated, directed attention. The other aspect, or the other half, is called vipassana. And vipassana means special insight. You could also call this comprehension. So these two components are meditation itself. Looked at in, a, in another way, you can say that shamatha is the ability to observe something serenely. You could also call it pratyahara. Vipassana, vipassana would be the ability to analyze the object of meditation. So first you have to have the capacity to observe something serenely without being distracted. That's shamatha. And once you have that ability to concentrate and observe something, then you can analyze that in order to understand it. And that is vipassana. 
These are two different things. And there are different practices taught in the Tibetan schools, in the Mahayana schools, related to these two aspects. But why are these important to us? We all hear that meditation is important. We know that it's important. But do we realize its importance? Are we cognizant, conscious of its importance? In the foundational path, the Shravakayana, students learn how to meditate in order to comprehend the nature of the teachings and the nature of karma. In the foundational levels of the teaching, the student is primarily learning how their own ego creates their own suffering. And we know that when we start to really analyze our own experience, that our own suffering is self-produced. This has to be arrived at consciously, not just hearing the idea and accepting it because it sounds right. You have to experience this. You have to become conscious of it, to see it in yourself. When you have that conscious observation repeatedly, you continue to deepen your understanding of how you produce your own suffering. From that arises the spontaneous recognition that you must do something with yourself to change suffering. You can't change circumstances because that won't change anything. Our external circumstances merely reflect what's inside of us. What is our state of consciousness? And this is what Samael and Vior points out throughout his books. What is outside of us is merely a reflection of what is inside. So if we want to change our circumstances, if we change what's inside, the outside will naturally change. This is a law. That's how nature works. So in that way, we learn that we need to meditate in order to comprehend the nature of our own self, the nature of our experience. That process is encompassed in those three factors that we keep discussing. The first one is to cease activity that's harmful. Death to restrain harmful action. And you can't do that unless you're aware of where the harmful action is arising in yourself. You can't restrain your anger unless you understand your anger, unless you see it and you know how it works. Once those qualities, the negative qualities, are being restrained, then we need to know what to do with them because we can't just suppress things. We have to understand what to do with them. And that's the second step of birth, to adopt virtuous action. But how do you do that? How do you know what's right to do? If we are so swallowed up by suffering and pain and ignorance, by pride, by lust, we have to meditate. We have to separate the consciousness from that harmful element. This has two aspects. We separate from the harmful element because we know it's harmful. We experience the results of it. It's painful. So we separate from that. This is the need for meditation. That's part of the need. In that separation of samadhi, we can observe that harmful element in serenity, in peace, And this is what shamatha refers to. The Tibetan version of this word shamatha is shine. Shine means dwelling in peace. Shine is calm abiding, the silence of the mind, stability of consciousness. This is a sort of flexibility and stability that the consciousness has, whereby distractions discursive emotions, any kind of sensory input, cannot upset our concentration. We can remain fixed and observing the cause of suffering. First, to recognize how that cause of suffering has arisen, how it produces suffering, 
how it functions so we can stop feeding it and stop supporting it. But secondly, to extract from that virtuous action. Hidden within that element of suffering are the clues for how it should behave. Because that ego, that aggregate in the mind, traps consciousness within it. The elements that we need in order to realize ourselves are hidden, buried inside of that element. And it can only be extracted once we separate ourselves. Put another way, if you're in the cage, you can't see the cage. So it's necessary to get out temporarily in order to see that cage and understand it. And in that way, you can start to understand. Meditation has two aspects. We comprehend the ego. We comprehend the virtue. And it's in that balance that you start to really understand the nature of wisdom, the nature of the middle path. So if we're trying to develop virtues, we're trying to adopt virtuous action and in turn realize the third factor, which is to serve others. We can't do that with mere concentration. Shamatha, shine, by itself, <clears throat> cannot free the ego, cannot destroy that ego, cannot free the consciousness. The only way to do that is to have insight, comprehension, wisdom, and that we arrive at through vipassana. So let's back up one little step so you can see the structure. Shamatha is going to be primarily related to the fifth paramita, dhyana, meditation. Vipassana, insight, will be primarily related with the sixth paramita, pranya, or wisdom. So today's lecture is mostly concerned with how to set up the, the basis for meditation, which is shamatha. How do we build that foundation to stabilize the mind and then once the mind becomes stable and the consciousness is focused and directed, then we can begin to find wisdom through vipassana, which is related to that sixth paramita, pranya. If you've studied meditation before, then you would have heard about absorption meditation, and analytical. And these are these two. Shamatha is absorption. Vipassana is analytical. Gnosis teaches both. We find both aspects of meditation are taught in the Gnostic tradition, but these terms are not used. The way that Samael and Vior taught is very synthetic very direct, very to the point. In many cases, he discards with terminology and structures altogether and gives extremely practical, refined instructions. And this is because he knows our minds are already so complicated and confused. He's trying to provide to us tools which will cut through the mind. But we have to use them. Unfortunately, most Western students particularly English-speaking students, are so intellectual, so habituated to being in the intellect, that they will not actually practice something until they feel they have a good intellectual grasp of it. This is a unique characteristic of North Americans. You don't find this characteristic as much in people from the southern parts of this continent such as Mexico and, be, and below, South America. You don't find that intellectualism as prevalent. So there, people that are not so intellectual will be more willing to practice something, to try something, before they have to be so intellectual about it. So in these classes, we're trying to assist you, to give you a little more of an intellectual grasp so you can relate this teaching and understand it in relation to other traditions and understand the roots of this tradition. When I mentioned that Samael Anvior is a great lama, 
what I'm expressing to you is that in the context, in the contents of all of the writings and all of the teachings of Gnosis, you will find all the teachings of Buddhism, but synthesized. In some way you could say hidden. The beauty of that is that if you've studied Buddhism, then you're familiar with the terms and structures and how things work. And when you study the writings of Samuel and Bior, you'll immediately recognize the same tradition. But if you don't have that benefit of a, of a comprehensive education in Buddhism, you might miss it. So I want to give you some examples <clears throat> of how that teaching is hidden here. And the reason I'm giving you this is so that you see I'm not just pulling rabbits out of a hat. The teachings that I'm offering to you today from my experience and from the teachings of Samayon Vior and from the teachings of Maitreya are all in agreement. Some Gnostic students have not heard Gnosis presented from this angle. So that's why I want to demonstrate to you that these teachings are contained within the books. Let's start with an example. The highest teachings related to Shamatha or to the development of a stable, penetrating, discriminating awareness are broken up into different schools in Tibetan Buddhism. <clears throat> There's two primary schools that teach meditation in Tibetan Buddhism. The first one I'll discuss is called Maha Mudra. This is a Sanskrit word. Maha means great or um, enormous or deep. And mudra means seal, as in a stamp, a seal, a certification, something authentic. So this term maha mudra means the great seal. This teaching of maha mudra is a teaching of absorption meditation. It's a method to, you, to unite the five paramitas and develop equanimity of consciousness in order to reach prana. <clears throat> in Tibetan, Mahamudra is called Chagya Chempo. This method of Mahamudra is taught in the, primarily the Kagyu school, which is the school founded and propagated by Naropa, Marpa, Tilopa, Milarepa, Gampopa. These are all great masters of Tibetan Buddhism. The teachers of this method include Maitreya, Asanga, Atisha, Nagarjuna, and more. Most of these instructors and teachers have been discussed by Samala and Vior and recommended. The same teaching is also found in the Gelug and Sakya schools. And of course, the Gelug school is related with the Dalai Lamas. Related to this, in a sort of hidden way, the master, Samael Anvior, wrote in his book, The Zodiacal Course, that the doctrine of the heart is called the seal of the truth, or the true seal. Truth is dharma. Seal is mudra. True seal is maha mudra. So the Master Samael and Vior, without stating the Sanskrit word, was stating the doctrine of the heart that we need is contained in maha mudra. And in that same book, in the beginning of the book, he, he differentiates between the heart doctrine and the eye doctrine. The eye doctrine is all the intellectual theories that people have, beliefs. The heart doctrine is the work with the consciousness to realize the nature of the truth, the Dharma. So here we have the Master saying, the doctrine of the heart is also called the seal of the truth, or the true seal. In other words, Mahamudra. <clears throat> Mahamudra is taught in those particular schools of Tibetan Buddhism that I mentioned. But there's a complementary teaching, which is nearly identical, which is taught in the Nyingma school. And in Tibetan, this school is called Dzogchen. Dzogchen is just a shortened version of the words 
Zogpa Chenpo in Tibetan. And this means great perfection. And what are we studying in this course but the perfections, the paramitas? So Dzogchen relates to the great paramita, the great perfection. And this is, of course, the union of shamatha and vipassana. Comprehension of the emptiness through bodhicitta. Related to this, the Dalai Lama said, according to the Nyingma tradition, Dzogchen is the most profound of all the vehicles leading to enlightenment. But unless the practitioner has the capacity to understand the teachings properly, mistaken views can develop. Without a deep intellectual and experiential foundation, it can easily lead to confusion. So you see he's pointing out we need both experiential understanding and intellectual understanding. Without that, it's easy to become confused. And we find that in Gnosis is the same. Students of Gnosis can become easily confused because the teaching is so potent, so powerful, it requires a great deal of understanding. Padmasambhava said of Dzogchen that it is the secret, unexcelled cycle of the supreme vehicle of Tantra, the true essence of the definitive meaning, the short path for attaining Buddhahood in one life the direct path. Now, to understand this, we need to grasp that Dzogchen means the great perfection. And as I was explaining, that teaching is embodied in the symbol of the Divine Mother, Tara, who with her position of her body is representing the aspects of that we need to comprehend through our experience. Related to this, the Master Samael wrote in Revolutionary Psychology, our own particular individual cosmic mother possesses wisdom, love, and power. Absolute perfection exists within her. Absolute perfection is Dzogchen. Dzogpa. Zog, what is it? Zogpa Chenpo. So these teachings are the wisdom, heart knowledge of our own inner Buddha, our own inner Divine Mother. So let's, let's get down to the point here. This Paramita is called Dhyana, D-H-Y-A-N-A. The term dhyana has a very um, long and rich history. This is a Sanskrit word. In the Pali language, which is another ancient language of India, this word is said jhana. So J-H-A-N-A. In Chinese, this word is said chan. In Japanese, it is said Zen. So each one of these traditions is teaching the same idea, but with a different methodology, according to a different psychology. Dhyana, which is Sanskrit, is common in Hinduism. The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali teach Dhyana. It's the fifth stage of the Yogas of Patanjali. This is the fifth stage of Raja Yoga, which is the royal yogic path of meditation, the comprehensive path that unites all the yogas and is taught by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. Dhyana is this fifth paramita of Buddhism, which is meditation, concentration, shamatha. In the Pali language, it is jhana. This is related to the foundational path, to the Shravakayana teachings, the introductory level teachings. And in that context, jhana is just related to forms of concentration. Mm. 
In Chinese, it's Chan. Chan comes from dhyana, and the root of that teaching is from Bodhidharma, who was a student of the Buddha, who brought Buddhism to China. And in that, he founded a particular psychology of meditation, a particular way of understanding and comprehending the mind, which is called Chan Buddhism. That teaching moved on from China into Japan and became Zen. So you see then, we have all the levels of the schools. Study meditation. Gnosis contains them all. In our Gnostic teachings, we have practices that relate to practices of developing meditation, or dhyana, related to each of the levels of the schools. You'll find very basic preliminary concentration practices, which would be related to jhana, or preliminary concentration. We also have teachings that are more closely related with Mahayana, which are a little more sophisticated and bring in more comprehension of compassion. We also have teachings related to Tantrayana, to developing dhyana or meditation, meditative stability in relation to the secret path. So all of those teachings are encompassed here. What we need to grasp is something very critical. These teachings, the different ways of approaching meditation, meditating, uh, approaching the comprehension and understanding of using the attention, these are not all going to the same place. Each path is different. Each path provides elements for the development of a student, but in accordance with a certain goal. In the beginning lectures of this course, we talked about these three paths and the differences between them. The Master Samael and Vior taught meditation in a very synthetic, advanced way. You'll find in his teachings elements of all of the schools, elements that relate to the foundational path, elements that relate to the Mahayana path, and elements that relate to the Tantrayana path. And this is because we all have different needs. We all have different things that we need to develop. We already have certain capacities, and we need to acquire other ones. So there are different practices taught, but they are not all the same. They're not equivalent with each other. Concentration practices that correspond to the Shravakayana, or foundational path, will not take you to the same place of a meditation practice related to Tantrayana or Mahayana. It cannot. We who are lost in the darkness can't necessarily see the difference. But there is a difference. We need to understand this clearly when we experiment with these practices, but especially when we teach them. We have to be very clear about the, the purpose of each practice and what it can produce. They are not all equally interchangeable. A very crude way of understanding this would be to imagine that you have just realized that you're in the middle of a big war. You've just grasped that death is at the brink of descending upon you because there's a battle raging all around you. This is actually the case. We're 97% trapped in the ego. This means we have a 3% capacity left to escape if we use it. If we don't use it, we're lost. We'll be absorbed in that battle, crushed. That is a terrifying situation to find yourself in. If you can imagine all of a sudden finding yourself in the worst, hottest war zone with extreme acts of violence and suffering all around you, you're going to want to get out. You may also feel a lot of concern for the other people that are trapped there. That's bodhicitta. Some people don't care. They just want to get out. That is shravakayana. That's foundational path. The concern to do something for others is mahayana. 
You want to help them. But first, you have to be able to get out yourself. The complete renunciation of yourself to help others is Tantrayana. That's the Bodhisattva path. Now, finding yourself in this situation, you'll see, luckily for you, there are a few ways out. The easiest one for you to grasp and learn and get on and use is a donkey. There's a donkey there that you can get on and ride and ride out of this war. That donkey is the foundational path. It's a very useful animal, very helpful, but it's slow. It can only go so fast and it can only go so far. You also see there a car. A car is faster. It's also a little more dangerous. And it requires more elements. It's a more complicated device, a more complicated vehicle, more sophisticated, requires training. That is the Mahayana. But you also see a jet airplane. Obviously, much faster, much more complicated, much more sophisticated, but it will get you out right away. Now, if we extend this analogy a little bit, and we say, well, the only way to get out of this war is to go up a big mountain. How far up that mountain is the donkey going to get? Especially if the conditions are very rough or steep. It's not going to get far. The car as well can only go so far, but the jet can go over, can go to the top, can go beyond. This is the difference in a crude analogy between these different schools and between the practices that correspond to each school. This is important for us to understand because the goal is absolute liberation, not partial If we acquire partial liberation, we still remain in danger. We still remain threatened and with the possibility of falling back into lower realms, into suffering. We need to go very far beyond in order to fully escape the dangers. For this, we have to understand what these words have in their roots. Dhyana and jhana are both related to a Sanskrit root, nya. J-N-A. Nya in Sanskrit means to know. It's the same as gnosis. To know. But mere knowledge of something only reaches a point of uh, a relative degree of development because there is knowledge that is beyond In other words, there are two truths, conventional and ultimate. What we experience now is conventional truth, but we're trapped in suffering. We need ultimate truth, absolute truth, which is prajna. If you put pra in front of the nya, pra means before. The sixth paramita is prajna which is related to the absolute, to the emptiness, to wisdom, to that which is before knowledge. Primordial, root wisdom. Shunyata, the unmanifest. That is where we find absolute ultimate liberation. Only bodhisattvas can reach that. Only tantrayana can reach it. Shravakayana teachings cannot. Foundational level teachings do not comprehend the emptiness. Therefore, if we are studying these teachings, we have to grasp this essential, essential point. Bodhicitta is the union of compassion and emptiness. Therefore, we need to balance our comprehension of the two. Bodhicitta is the hallmark of Mahayana and Tantrayana. Mahayana is the gateway 
to the direct path. It is the door of entry to reaching the absolute. No one else can reach that except the bodhisattva. In one of the old sutras, it says, and the sutra is called Mahayana Prasada Prabhavana Sutra. It says, understand, O noble son, that the faith the bodhisattvas have in the Mahayana teachings and whatever they have attained through them originates from the essence of the completely undistracted mind, which is dhyana, and from contemplation on true reality, which is prana. In other words, bodhisattvas must work with both dhyana, stable meditation, discriminating awareness, and prana, comprehension of the absolute. Why is this important? There are teachings, including Gnostic instructors, who do not understand the nature of shamatha, the nature of the undistracted, focused mind. And they will teach, as has been taught in many mistaken schools throughout history, not just in Gnosis, but widely prevalent in Buddhism, in Hinduism, and many other teachings. They will teach this, that quietude or concentration consists of not thinking of anything at all. And that the mind just rests in a state of dullness. This is wrong. In the books of Samael and Vior, we find the master also often states, put your mind in silence. Put your mind in a blank state. Empty your mind of thoughts. He'll state these things. This is a very profound statement. This is not an easy thing to do. It's a mistake to skip that and try to practice what else he describes if you cannot first acquire mental stability and calm. Shamatha means a state of mind that is bright and clear and focused and calm and stable, peaceful, but very bright, no dullness, nothing vague. It is awake. This is a state of awakened consciousness. These mistaken teachings also say that while you're in this sort of mental um, blankness, that if you examine the mind, then you find there's nothing there, and that is the nature of emptiness. This is wrong. It sounds like the same thing that we're teaching, doesn't it? That we have to put the mind in a state of emptiness and analyze the nature of that mind and find that there's nothing there. There's no real self. This is a very subtle thing to grasp. There's a very subtle difference between a right understanding of this and a wrong understanding. The difference is in awakened consciousness. Awake. And that can only be known by experiencing it. Quietude of the mind, silence of the mind, has two features that must be present. The first one is mental stability and flexibility. That means that the mind should be very calm, our attention very bright, very clear, very awake. The second aspect is clarity of perception. There's nothing vague there. Things are absolutely clear. If you close your eyes now and you see darkness and your mind is vague and buffeting you with thoughts and feelings and sensations and memories, this is not quietude. Even if the mind becomes somewhat quiet and you feel a sense of peace, if you do not have clarity of perception with your eyes closed, meaning you perceive clearly what your mind is doing, then you do not have mental quietude. There are states of consciousness that seem similar, but that nonetheless are dull. 
not sharp. <clears throat> Yet, not even this is enough. Developing mental quietude is something we're going to come to in a few minutes to discuss in more detail. But it isn't enough. We must develop bodhicitta. <clears throat> There's a very highly regarded lama who gave a teaching, <clears throat> and he said this, if you do not have bodhicitta, now let me stop there for a second and remind you, bodhicitta is not just compassion. Many of us have that idea that bodhicitta is just compassion. It is not. Bodhicitta is compassion united with comprehension of emptiness. It's very important to always remember that. So he says, if you do not have bodhicitta, then no matter what meditations you do in the hope of achieving Buddhahood, be they on Mahamudra or Dzogchen, the middle way or the generation and completion stages, they will not get you one bit closer to Buddhahood. And as if this were not enough, you will not even enter the gateway of the Mahayana. Thus, everybody must concentrate on the development of bodhicitta. The Buddhas have perceived things for many eons with the primal wisdom of their omniscience. They have not seen any better method or any other gateway to the path. And we find this same thing expressed throughout the teachings of Samael and Lior. If you read and study revolutionary psychology, I don't mean just read it. I mean study it. Read a passage, meditate, reflect, go slowly, really digest the contents of the book. You'll see the whole book is a teaching of Mahamudra and Dzogchen. Is a teaching that's emphasizing the need to serenely analyze the mind and comprehend its true nature, which is empty. That comprehension must be performed in conjunction with compassion, concern for others. And he states that pretty explicitly. I'm making these points and building this foundation for your understanding for a reason. Gnosis is new in English. The, this particular thread has only recently come into English. And because it's very challenging, very demanding, unfortunately, some students want to find easier methods. They read and study the teachings of Samael and Vior and become inspired and become dedicated. But because they don't fully practice the teachings, they want easier methods. And then they hear, well, this is related to Buddhism, so let me go study some Buddhism and bring those practices in. They do that without realizing that sometimes they bring in teachings that belong to other forms of Buddhism or different schools, and they don't understand how those teachings incorporate. For example, the Master Samael teaches a lot of Zen, comments often about the benefits of Zen practice. So there are Gnostic instructors who study Zen very devotedly. Zen teachings are very good. They have a lot of tools, but they do not have all of them. Zen is a teaching that has been in existence for many hundreds of years, and it has many beneficial things, but it is not the whole teaching. And it fits into Mahayana teachings, if it's properly practiced. But in the West, it is usually not. In the West, Zen has become devoid of much of its true esoteric content. Thus, it has degenerated into a Shravakayana teaching in many places. It no longer has, in many places, its true full content. It has been stripped, just like other religions. It has been adulterated. And this is because many of the students and teachers and practitioners of Zen have not comprehended their own tradition and thus have removed those things they don't understand. The same thing is happening in Gnosis. 
Teachers and students don't understand things, so they don't investigate them. They leave them out, thus they adulterate. Worse, they bring in other teachings and add them to Gnosis, and they adulterate Gnosis. Samael and Vior address this specifically in the Pistis Sophia Unveiled. <clears throat> Adultery includes adulterating the knowledge. And this is a grave act. <clears throat> Very significant. When we study a teaching, when we study a practice, we need to fully investigate where does this practice come from? Where can this practice take you? Now we're studying Gnosis, which is a teaching of Samael and Vior. It is beholden of the student to investigate Samael and Vior, to not simply take the teachings for, on face value, but to investigate them, to practice them, to know by faith, meaning by experience, where these teachings come from. <clears throat> this, the very, your very soul depends upon it. Your happiness or suffering depends upon it. The health of your psyche depends upon it. You can't take things at face value. You have to know for yourself, by your own experience, what is valuable and true and what is not. There are many useful and important teachings in the world, many things that can help us, and all of us have different needs. We may need to bring in elements from our own uh, tradition, the tradition that's in our soul. That may not be so explicitly addressed in Gnosis. But we need to do that with a lot of prudence and examination of where those teachings come from and who is giving them. What type of realizations has the teacher acquired? You can't find that out by asking someone. And you can't find that out on the Internet. That comes out through your own internal investigations. And that's very difficult to come by when you're a beginning student. So you have to be very prudent. This is why in traditional guru yoga, it's always advised for the student to take three to five years of investigating a teacher before you take a person as your teacher. We don't do that now. We just immediately assume something, we adopt it, we begin to use it and proclaim ourselves a follower and not realize what we get ourselves into. We need to be prudent, but we also need to work. Now, this reminds us of certain situations that have arisen in the Gnostic tradition that have created some problems, that have unfortunately caused students to become misled. It's very sad. Certain instructors and students of Gnosis, in their good intentions, have brought in other teachings and taught them as a part of Gnosis, but they are not. And they did this and, have, and still do this with the intention to help, but without fully investigating the sources, the roots, and the ultimate possible reach of these additional teachings. We have, for example, there are um, students who, and teachers who have sought out practices of meditation because they believe and feel that the way meditation is taught in the tradition of Samael and Vior is somehow lacking. What we can say is that the teachings are not lacking. They are very demanding. Yes. And that's because these times are very demanding. We need strong action, strong practice. But these threads, these, uh, these schools have brought in teachings, for example. There's one related to jhanas. It's called jhanas. And this is from the Pali. This is related to a Shravakayana teaching. 
there's a particular teaching related to jhanas of learning how to enter into and advance through certain stages of concentration. This is useful. There's nothing wrong with that. But unfortunately, students have misunderstood and have adopted this approach without understanding that its reach is limited. A shravaki on a teaching does not include comprehension of emptiness. Therefore, it is not part of the bodhisattva path. It can only reach so far. We have also examples of people bringing in psychological teachings because they don't understand the psychology of gnosis. They want something easier. We have a teaching that's prevalent in pop psychology now called the Enneagram. The Enneagram is not gnosis. It has nothing to do with gnosis. The pop psychology version. If you look at it, you'll see that the people who propagate and teach this doctrine are not people who propagate and teach the path of the bodhisattva. They don't even teach white tantrism. They're people who are making money. This is not part of tantrayana. It sounds similar in the same way as the practice I described to you before about putting the mind in blank. It sounds very similar. So it has a kind of seductive power. And it makes it sound like a key that will make your work easier. But it is not. It is a delusion. And if you seriously study the actual teachings of Tantriyana and the teachings of Samael and Lior, the illusion will be dispelled. You will see it. Another example are people who, students and teachers, who study even advanced teachings like Mahamudra or Dzogchen and then learn to imitate the flavor of those teachings and talk like those teachings and posit questions and answers in a flavor similar to those teachings. But those people have no realization of their own. They merely imitate. And this is true in all schools. This happens. This has been a problem in Tibetan Buddhism for centuries. That people will act like lamas, pose as yogis, but have no real realization of their own. But it's easy to fool themselves and it's easy for them to fool others. These are very unfortunate things because people, particularly people who pose in this way, put themselves in a position as if they have great understanding and then begin to give advice. But they're giving advice without having any comprehension, without having any experience, conscious experience. And in this context, what we're talking about is comprehension of the absolute. There are people who present themselves as great bodhisattvas, as great yogis, and they'll talk all about very elevated, very sophisticated sounding teachings, but have no real comprehension, no realization of prana. And for a student, it's very difficult to identify someone who has real understanding from someone who is a liar. This is somewhat like the, those people who go around and pose as doctors or lawyers or policemen. And for a common person, we can't tell because we don't have the education to know if they really know what they're talking about or not. So if we go back to our former example of the different vehicles, we who are simple people can't tell if somebody's really a jet pilot or not because they can dress like a jet pilot, they can talk the lingo, they can act sort of mysterious and different. So we'll think, oh, they must be a jet pilot because they sure look like it. But they're not. The only one who can tell is the real pilot. And it's the same among yogis and mystics and lamas. 
The only ones, hmm? And Kabbalists, naturally. The only ones who can really tell who are real are the real ones. Because they have the experience. They have the direct knowledge. They have the real gnosis, the real nya. So as students, we need to be very prudent. We need to study things and apply them and practice them and understand where they come from. In all of these three cases that I've outlined for you, there's a little bit of advice you can use to help you determine, does a practice fit in or not? Does it really lead where I need to go? And this is the statement that was made by a lama many centuries ago about Dzogchen. He said, someone who has real experience of Dzogchen, real experience of the emptiness, has these virtuous experiences arise in themselves. One, the realization of impermanence. Two, a reduction in the range of the mind in terms of the mind being all over the place. And from the depth of their heart, loving kindness, compassion, pure perception, devotion, without partiality. Therefore, if we see a person who claims to be a practitioner of high teachings, but they are cruel, insensitive, they lie, they are not honest, then we can see quite clearly that they have no understanding. If they are selfish, greedy, then we can see it. Someone who has genuine experience of Dzogchen, of Pranya, of wisdom, will have a great deal of bodhicitta because that experience of Pranya can only come from bodhicitta. And bodhicitta, remember, union of compassion and understanding of emptiness. Truly, meditation is beautifully taught in Gnosis. Very practical, very synthetic. But our mind doesn't get it because we don't practice. We don't have enough diligence, enough zeal, enough patience, enough self-discipline, enough generosity. We don't have bodhicitta. When we develop bodhicitta, and we begin to study the books of Samael and Vyor, the practices come naturally. They will come naturally because your own inner being will help you, will give you the guidance you need. If you really want to understand Gnosis, to understand meditation in Gnosis, study these books, Revolutionary Psychology, Great Rebellion, Revolution of the Dialectic. But when I say study, I'm not saying just read them. I say meditate on them. Read a little bit, meditate a lot. Read a little bit, meditate a lot. Practice them every day, moment to moment. Put them into work. When you do that, you're incorporating elements in your consciousness, which will bring more comprehension, more understanding, and your own meditation practice will develop naturally and beautifully. This is the great hidden treasure contained in these books. It is a great gift of God that these three books are so comprehensible by beginners. And that's why we have beginners who arrive in Gnosis often cite Great Rebellion and Revolutionary Psychology as their favorite books. But as, as it happens, these are the most advanced books of the tradition. Revolution of the Dialectic, particularly. They're the most advanced because if you look at the Master's teachings, he said all his writings are coming on a scale. And when he completes the octave, he will leave. What were the last books he wrote? Revolutionary Psychology, Great Rebellion, Revolution of the Dialectic, and some other ones, like Torah and Kabbalah and Peace to Sophia. They are not the easiest books. They are not the beginning notes of the scale. Perfect matrimony is. The Zodiacal Course, Major Mysteries. These books are very important as early notes. 
but people don't think that they are foundational books because they seem so advanced. But you need to con consider this. We start step by step. The first steps are perfect matrimony. That is the basis of this teaching. You cannot get Gnosis if you only study revolutionary psychology. You cannot. That book only works in context of having a foundation of perfect matrimony. So you start there. You work through the scale. In order to do that, you have to know what the consciousness is. You have to understand what it is you're trying to awaken and develop. The consciousness is the root of perception. It is that perceiving element that is within us, which is there before sensations, before thoughts, before feelings. Observe yourself right now very closely. Don't think about it. Just watch. Watch what happens. What did your mind do? When that sound came to you, were you able to see all the stages of that process? What was the first thing you noticed? Was it the thought? What is that? Actually, that thought is the last thing that happens. Did you notice all the things that happened before that thought arose? What about the emotion? There's an emotional reaction, right? Surprise, shock, maybe fear. That comes before the thought. But there was other things before that. The sound arrived into your senses, into your motor instinctive sexual brain. But something happened before that too. The sound arrived to your consciousness. That understanding is critical. To learn to see that. That is the basis of shamatha. Sharp, Focused, clear perception without distraction. If you've ever seen lightning at night, the lightning strikes, but then the sky is illuminated for a moment before it passes and then becomes dark again. Have you ever noticed that? The same thing happens in the mind. If we imagine the mind is a body of water we, as the Buddha nature, the essence, are there on top of that water. And all the impressions of life are striking the water, being absorbed by our own mind. But they create waves because we're not receiving those impressions attentively and consciously. Thus, the mind is chaotic. When we learn how to receive those impressions consciously, to watch them arriving, to watch them strike the water, the water absorbs the impression and there is no wave. That is mental quietude, shamatha. But that doesn't arrive through evolution. It does not arrive through any trick. There is no secret teaching or unique thread that will teach that to you like that. You can only teach yourself by paying attention from moment to moment, by learning how to exercise your consciousness and transform impressions. To do it well, to arrive quickly at real understanding of this, there are certain prerequisites. If we apply these prerequisites, we set up conditions which are conducive to the arising of this understanding. If we don't have these conditions, it becomes much more difficult to understand this. These prerequisites are taught by the Maitreya Buddha. They're very simple. The first one 
as having a good place, a conducive place to meditate. We need a peaceful atmosphere. So in our home, we should find a space where we can meditate where it's quiet, where we don't have a lot of distractions or any distractions if possible. And we can isolate ourselves for brief periods of time in order to meditate serenely. This is especially important when we're beginning our practice because the mind is very chaotic and it's easily distracted. Later on, we can develop the ability to meditate in even chaotic environments and not be disturbed. But don't just rush off and try to meditate in a train station. You'll just frustrate yourself. Start where you are. Cultivate an environment that supports your practice. The second prerequisite is having few wants. If we're always being distracted by, by wants and desires, like um, whatever, wanting to move, wanting a better place to live, wanting a better spouse, wanting more money, wanting a better job, wanting a better city to live in, anything like that, it will interfere with our practice. We need to be simple, not let the mind get absorbed in all kinds of distracting desires. The third one is being content. Accepting what we have if it is acceptable. If you're in prison, you're in prison. You need to accept it. But if you live in a house where there's a lot of loud music playing all the time, you should probably move. So change those things that you can in order to develop an environment that supports your practice. Being content has a lot to do with material things, you know, wanting a, a better chair to meditate in. This isn't necessary all the time. Sometimes it's just a desire. But it also has to do with being content with our level of being. In the sense that don't try to act like something you're not. Don't act like you're a great yogi or great meditator if you're not. Become one by being it, and then you don't have to act like it. So being content means being practical, dealing with the reality of things. The fourth is to completely abandon the demands of society. This is really important. It's easy to come caught up in all the demands of society, and it will totally distract us from our practice. This also relates to the teachings. Sometimes we turn our religion or our teachings into a sort of society that has a lot of demands. So we may be part of a school that always is having social activities, going here, going there. We should not be victim or feel obligated to do these things. These are demands of society, even if they occur within a religion or a school. The fifth is having pure ethics. You won't be able to meditate if you're still drinking alcohol, if you're doing drugs, if you're stealing, if you're committing adultery, if you're fornicating. Your meditation practice will go nowhere. All of these activities disrupt the mind. They produce vibrations in the mind that will prevent it from being calm. This is why ethics are so important. We need to stop harmful actions so that those energies will stop upsetting the mind and it will start to calm. The sixth is to completely abandon conceptual thought. This one's hard, especially for a beginner because we're still trying to grasp the concept of the teaching. This is related partly to having desires. For example, having desires for experiences of meditation. We have to abandon that desire. We have the longing, and that's what in inspires us to practice. But when that longing becomes a desire, it poisons our practice. So we have to be careful. Also, the longing to memorize gnosis or the desire to memorize Gnosis, can also become a problem. We can become too intellectual. We have to balance our practice and our study. Over-conceptualizing the teaching can ruin our practice. 
So once we set up those basic prerequisites, what we're doing is creating an environment within which the conditions within which our mind can start to settle. But the mind will settle in direct correspondence with our self-observation. There is a direct relationship. If we set up all these environment, environmental factors and behavioral factors, but we don't self-observe, we still won't meditate well. Meditation is an extension of self-observation. Self-observation is the process whereby we direct attention moment to moment, all day, watching our own mind. Meditation is the same thing. We just close our eyes. Once we start our practice, we start our actual meditation, there are certain obstacles that we'll need to deal with repeatedly until we actually acquire mental stability. And we don't have time today to go into detail into these. But in synthesis, they are laziness, forgetting the instructions, excitement, or dullness. There's some information about these obstacles in the meditation course on the Gnostic Teachings website. Our meditation practice, or rather our shamatha practice, is a practice in which we sit we relax, we close our eyes. To relax means to relax all three brains. We relax our whole physical body. And there's a practice, a guided practice, that can help us learn how to do that, also on the Gnostic radio side. This one's quite thorough and long. And once you learn how it works, it's very simple. You can shorten it according to your need. But it's very important with every practice of meditation to relax first. Because if you don't, there will be residual tension that you're not aware of that will interrupt your practice, and you'll just become frustrated and stop. So it's good to set up the foundation first. Relax. Relax your whole physical body, then relax your emotional brain, and relax your intellectual brain. This sets up the conditions. All of these things we've discussed so far set up the conditions that we need in order to practice well. At this point, we close the eyes and we begin to focus on an object. There are many different kinds of objects that we can adopt for our practice. In the lower schools, like foundational path, practitioners or yogis will take on even a stick or a rock and just work to concentrate the mind on that or a dot. But since Gnosis is more concerned with Mahayana and Tantrayana, we prefer to take something that will have more um, profound benefits. So if you feel very um, inspired by a particular Buddha or a master or an angel, that should be your focus of meditation. In order to develop some concentration, you can focus on Jesus, Buddha, Master Samael, and close your eyes and imagine this is why we have sacred images or tankas, or paintings or sculptures, is to give us something we can observe physically, study it in detail physically with our physical eyes, and then we close our eyes and imagine that. That imagination combined with concentration is what opens up the doors of meditation to us. But again, this is a preliminary practice. And there are many varieties of this kind of practice. I'm just giving you one example. Doing this, we start to learn about our mind. And a very useful graphic that illustrates the stages through which we'll pass is present in the Buddhist tradition, particularly Tibetan Buddhism. There is a teaching given by Maitreya Buddha called the Nine Stages of the Development of Shamatha. There's an example of this on our website. If you look in the resources and referencing area, references, you'll find a graphic called the stages of meditative concentration. This image depicts a winding path that shows a monk walking up the path. And 
Now, there are many symbols in this image, and I recommend that you look at the graphic in order to understand the things that I'm going to talk about. So let me get this one. The nine stages are represented by a monk who begins at the bottom right. Next to him, you can see a temple. The temple at the bottom right of the graphic represents the need for us to hear the teachings, to study the teachings. And that's why we have Gnostic schools and that's why we have Gnostic websites. This is where we arrive at hearing the doctrine. And you'll notice in most representations, the temple has three levels. These three levels represent the three aspects of the path. This temple also represents our place of practice, both as a meditation hall or a meditation room and our body. Because truly, our physical body needs to become a temple. The Bible says it is already, so we need to develop that, make it a holy place where we don't commit crimes. The monk represents the meditator, the person who is attempting to traverse this path to develop meditative stability. And the reason they're represented as a monk is to symbolize that we need to renounce worldly interests. We don't have to become monks physically and adopt robes and take vows and shave our heads. But in our mind, we need to do that. We need to renounce worldly concerns and demands. This doesn't mean that we abandon our families and jobs. No. We need to care for our responsibilities and be good citizens. But we need to renounce wants, desires, distractions. The winding path winds back and forth precisely because the process of developing concentration is a process of developing equilibrium. It's a process of learning how to balance from back and forth. The mind is always taking us back and forth on the pendulum, and we need to balance. Right when the monk begins, we see a turbulent river. The turbulent river represents the mind our own mind, which is chaotic, turbulent, and crazy. So in the beginning, when we first start to practice, it's very difficult to remain focused on the object of concentration, whether that is our ego, whether that is an image, or a mantra. Our attention is easily tossed around by our senses, by thoughts, and by the dullness of the mind. When we start to work with the mind, we see here symbolized that the monk is chasing an elephant and a monkey. The elephant is dark, and so is the monkey. The elephant represents the dullness of our mind, the heaviness. The mind is very heavy, stubborn, and we're trying to chase after it. The monkey represents the restless, agitated aspect of the mind. But you see, the monk has in his hands an axe or a hook and a rope. These represent mindfulness. Mindfulness and vigilance. And we need to use these two to harness the elephant and the monkey, to control them. We see at the first curve of the path a big flame. And usually the flame is close to the waters. The flame has many levels of meaning. The most superficial level is the flame represents the ferocity of our vigilance. When we begin to work to develop meditation practice, we have to be extremely vigilant, put a lot of energy and a lot of effort. That's why meditation can feel exhausting because we have to put so much energy into it because the mind is so out of control. And if you look up the path, you see that that fire diminishes until about 
three quarters of the way up, the fire is no longer there. And that's because at those levels of concentration, the vigilance becomes effortless, becomes natural. But then that fire emerges again at the top with a different aspect. The animals gradually become white as you look upwards along this path until they sit peacefully with the meditator. So we will have some materials on the website which will explain these nine stages in more detail. The ninth stage is the cultivation and application of actual shamatha, actual mental stability. And this is a state in which the mind is one-pointedly concentrated. But this is not samadhi. This is not prana. This is fundamental or uh, what do you call? Initial shamatha. It is not permanent or fully realized concentration. For that, you see additional stages where the monk is on a rainbow path, a rainbow bridge. This is related with higher levels of meditation, higher levels of shamatha. And we'll explain more details about this on the website. But for today, the thing that you need to grasp is this. Our purpose of meditation is to comprehend, to understand the mind. To do that, we don't have to get all the way to the ninth degree on this chart. It would be very useful if we can develop our practice that far. And at a certain point, it's necessary. But as beginners, it's sufficient for us to do enough practice till we reach the fourth stage the fourth or fifth. And in that region, the distinguishing characteristic is this. We do not forget that we're meditating. Let me state this another way so you'll understand. As a beginner, you should practice some form of concentration practice. It can be on an object, a visualization, a mantra. Develop concentration Practice this until you can sit to meditate and not forget that you're meditating. When you reach that stage of being able to concentrate your mind, even if there's discursive thoughts, there's still distractions coming, but you don't forget you're there to meditate. At that point, you've reached somewhere in the area of the fourth or fifth degree of shamatha. At that point, you can then begin to meditate effectively on the ego. Before that, it would be very difficult because you don't have enough mental stability yet. And so you become easily distracted. So when we teach concentration practices, like meditating on the breath, meditating on an image, this is the essential stage that we should be looking at as instructors and as students. Reach the fourth or fifth degree and develop the capacity to remember that you're meditating throughout your meditation session. The purpose of dhyana is to develop enough stability so that we can comprehend. We are in a war. We are at the brink of losing. 97% of our consciousness is trapped in ego and karma. We no longer have the time to spend years developing a concentration practice. We no longer have the time to waste a single day. We need to work effectively and accurately to cultivate enough mental stability so that we can then begin immediately to comprehend the ego, to comprehend ourselves. This is like saying that if we're in the middle of a war, we need soldiers to fight immediately. We're losing. There's no time for us to spend training soldiers a lot, especially in a lot of things that are kind of unrelated or might not be really necessary right now. 
because we need them in the battlefield right now. And this is your case and my case. We need to learn to meditate right now. We don't have time to go into retreat for three years. We don't have time to spend years learning practices that we might need later. We need practices we need now. Very practical. So let's learn to concentrate, develop bodhicitta, and develop enough mental stability that we can comprehend the ego every day. There are some who, unfortunately, persist in, in, in insisting on simple concentration practices for years, like Zen practice or jhana practice, and fail to teach students how to meditate on the ego. And these students are receiving a disservice. The entire purpose of Gnosis is the destruction of the ego, the elimination of karma. We need those practical techniques now. There's no time. Death is coming, karma is coming, suffering is coming. We need to make steps. So we don't need to go hide in the woods or go be in a monastery for a long time. We can develop these practices today at home, every day. This is why the Master said it would be useless to separate ourselves from the world and lock ourselves up in a convent or a cavern because the eyes are within us. We don't need to go to the woods to meditate on the eye. The eye is in us. We need to meditate now where we are. The, the basic outline of meditation that Samael and Vior teaches has many uh, approaches. Sometimes he teaches it from the point of view of yoga. For example, Raja Yoga or Patanjali's Yoga or other approaches that break it down into certain steps. We also have uh, the way he taught it in relation to imagination, inspiration, and intuition. Each of these approaches are really one. They are synthetic. The first stage of the threefold approach of imagination, inspiration, and intuition begins obviously with imagination. And that's why I suggest to you to work with developing your capacity to imagine by visualizing a deity. This is an ancient practice that has many benefits, particularly if you pick an actual realized Buddha or angel or master. Not someone that might be realized or you don't know what level of realization they have. You need to pick a very high being like Buddha, Krishna, um, Tara, Chinrezig, Jesus, Moses, one of these types of beings, very elevated. Because they represent qualities of your own consciousness which are very elevated and that's the kind of help we need. The imagination practice uh, that Master Samael gives has a lot of variety. There are different versions. But to effectively do any of them, you need concentration first. You need to have enough stability of mind to actually imagine something and hold that image clearly in your mind. And if your mind is chaotic and you keep forgetting you're meditating, then develop that concentration first. Learn how your mind is working. Apply the antidotes that we described, setting up the conditions for your practice. Keep practicing. One clue or key to meditation can be found in the way you build a fire. If you've ever seen someone make a fire with sticks or with two flint rocks, if you only strike them together occasionally, there's no spark. You have to build up a kind of tension, a kind of dynamic energy, for the mind to, to develop that stability. And meditation is the same. You have to persist. Constant effort to keep the consciousness focused and attentive. And in that way, you reduce the impacts of the impressions and the mind settles naturally on its own. This is all explained in very beautiful ways in the books that I mentioned earlier. The actual practice of meditation that we're going towards is a practice of psychoanalysis. The visualization practices are very good and useful. The concentration practices are very good and useful. But in order for us to comprehend prana, to comprehend bodhicitta, to comprehend our karma, 
we need to analyze our own mind. The process to do this is outlined in the revolution of the dialectic. There's a little section called blue time or rest therapeutics. And this explains in a synthetic way different aspects of one practice. Something that may be hard for beginners to grasp is that gnosis is not a rigid, um, limited structure. For example, these nine stages of the development of shamatha are not permanent places. It isn't as if you can meditate for a few weeks and reach, let's say, the second or third degree, and you will remain there for the rest of your life. It does not work like that. You will remain there so long as you continue to make effort. If you stop practicing, you will lose that development. The same is true of higher degrees. You reach the ninth degree of shamatha, and you've developed this initial stability of the mind, This is a beautiful thing, but it is not permanent. It is sustained so long as you continue to sustain it by practicing. If you abandon your practice, you will lose that development. It's only when you get into the very advanced degrees of concentration practice, of shamatha, that some permanent quality of this capacity will remain with you. And that's related with the creation of the solar mental body. It's also related with the sphere of Gebra, the divine soul, or Buddhi. The union and and interaction of those two is the nature of shamatha and vipassana working together. Those two, shamatha and vipassana, are working together. They can comprehend the emptiness, the absolute. The vehicle to that is through Atman, through Chesed. So we need to sustain our practice. We need to have the diligence to persist, to have the zeal to continue. The best source of the inspiration to persist in our practice is bodhicitta. There's no better inspiration than bodhicitta. To recognize and realize the nature of suffering and to dedicate one's practice for the benefit of others. This is not the same thing as metta bhavana, which is a term that belongs to the Pali um, Shravakayana traditions. The teachings that I talked about earlier called jhanas, they do a practice called metta bhavana. And this is related to um, cultivating concern or kindness, compassion for others. This is a beautiful thing, but it is not bodhicitta. Metabhavana is a practice that helps you cultivate concern and and, uh, awareness of the suffering of others and a well-wish for the others. But it does not include comprehension of the absolute. Therefore, it is not bodhicitta. So, by combining shamatha and vipassana, in other words, strong concentration with the nature of with analytical meditation into the nature of the object we're meditating on, we can really activate imagination, the first stage that Samuel Envoyor teaches. And from there comes the inspiration or symbols, things that arise in our meditation. And from that inspiration, which is the second degree, comes intuition. And intuition is the ability to understand. That is prana in a very sort of um, introductory or beginning degree. But in the same way that these levels of shamatha are not fixed permanent residences that we can then just move into and stay there forever, imagination, inspiration, and intuition are likewise states of consciousness that we move in and out of according to our development, according to our effort. Just because we've experienced a moment of stable mind does not mean we are established in a stable mind. 
just because we experience a moment of conscious imagination with clarity of perception, and then we receive symbols, which is the inspiration, and then maybe we understand a symbol, which is all good, but it doesn't mean we are established in that. It means we've tasted it. So in all of this description of meditation, the synthesis of what I'm expressing to you is this. As you practice, you will grasp little tastes of experiences, little tastes of more concentration, little tastes of comprehending an ego or comprehending an image or a deity or a teaching. Don't make the mistake of thinking that that is realization or that is liberation or that you've suddenly reached some great level and now you're a great master and now people should worship you and you have authority to teach all kinds of things. It doesn't mean that. It means that your practice is showing fruit. Keep it to yourself. Keep practicing, but keep your mouth shut. If you start talking about all these things, you will build pride in yourself. Not only that, you will build envy and resentment in others. And all of these things will become obstacles for you, very difficult obstacles. So the best thing to do, keep your mouth shut. Don't develop any any, you know, exalted opinions of yourself and just keep practicing. If you do have experiences, take it like this. The teachings work. Not that you're a great person and that you're a great master or maybe you were some great master in the past. No. Take it instead as these teachings are real. This actually works. So let me try harder. Let me put more energy into it. That is the useful approach. And that is the, a good quality you can use to develop your bodhicitta. The practice of meditation can only be understood by doing it. As many lectures as we can give, as many explanations as we can give, it will all remain useless and pointless if you don't actually do the practice. So I encourage you to begin today. Don't overcomplicate it. Be simple in your approach. But teach yourself how to direct your attention and stabilize your mind. The only one who can do it is you, and you have the tools already. You don't need to go looking in a lot of books or going to a lot of schools or teachings or classes or go find this or that master. The master you need is inside. And the master that is inside of you, your own inner being, already knows how to meditate. He already knows what you need to know. The problem is that we don't listen to him. We don't appeal to our Divine Mother for help. We instead go outside to schools and teachers and books. We need those things. We need the guidance to help our intellect become focused, to help our heart become focused. But the real master that we need, the real guru that we need, is inside and is found through meditation, through practice. Do you have any questions? Uh, what would you categorize uh, retrospection practice? Like in the beginning stages of anything? Uh, right. I was planning on talking about that today, but we've run out of time. Retrospection practice is the point of this whole lecture. We need enough concentration to have a stable mind so that when we retrospect our day, we review our behaviors, we no longer become identified with those memories, with those feelings, or with other distractions so that we can retain our focus and then gain insight into that experience or vipassana. Does that make sense? This is why I present the lecture in this way. Retrospection, psychoanalysis, is the heart of gnosis. Yes, transmutation is the foundation. It's very important. Yes, Kabbalah is essential. But none of those things mean anything if we don't comprehend the I. The comprehension of our ego is it. 
It is the work. But all of these parts have to work together. If you are just trying to meditate on your ego and you're not studying the Kabbalah and you're not studying Tantra, you also cannot advance. We need to balance these factors, birth, death, and sacrifice. And these are embodied in the two trees, Kabbalah and Tantra. They are embodied in birth and death and sacrifice. So retrospection or psychoanalysis is the practice we need to develop. My point in this lecture is this. If our mind is totally wild and chaotic and we can't retain focus on our memory of the day, we keep getting distracted, we need to develop concentration first. It's not going to take a year or two if we practice seriously. We can develop enough conscious concentration, directed attention, in a short period of time relative to our effort, relative to the circumstances that we produce, the causes that we produce. If we don't produce the causes, there will be no result. If we don't produce that stability of mind through our efforts, we cannot comprehend. It's simple. And unfortunately, there are students and teachers who persist in certain practices but don't ever stabilize the mind first. Don't learn how to reach that state that Samuel, or Samuel Envior indicates, to put the mind in silence. This means enter into dhyana, meditative stability. So if we don't have that capacity, we need to look in the rest of his teachings to see how to do it. And that's what this lecture is, how to do it. Yes? Okay, the question is, if we experience samadhi, is it with the 3% or the full 100%? Well, think about it. If the ego is trapped in, I mean, if the, the consciousness is trapped in the ego, how are you going to extract that? We have 3% that we say is still free, 3% more or less. We learn to use that 3% by self-observing, self-remembering, meditating, by learning how to direct our attention consciously with willpower. That's how we activate and use that 3%. That 3% can experience something that we can call samadhi. But samadhi has many levels. That's why we have the tree of life. That's why we have the wheel of life. That's why we study those levels of consciousness, the dimensions. And there are samadhis corresponding to those many levels. Sometimes a samadhi is just with that little 3%. Sometimes it's with more. Sometimes the being can help us and give us more capacity to experience something with more consciousness than we would normally be able to access. In general, though, we experience samadhi relative to our level of being, meaning how much ego we've eliminated, how much consciousness we have freed. But it's hard to say definitively because we do get a lot of help. So you'll have to see that in your own experience, how you might have certain experiences that clearly, with your own development, your own capacity, you couldn't do. But it's because you get help. So there's a little extra push, a little extra energy there. Right, this is a very good point. The statement is that some students believe we have to have a, like a massive samadhi in order to begin comprehension. And this is not true. As soon as you start to observe yourself and remember yourself, comprehension begins. The very recognition that we are a multiplicity that we need to self-observe implies comprehension. To even recognize the need for self-observation shows that you have a certain amount of comprehension already. And that's good. It's essential. Relative to meditation, you can have comprehension without entering into a profound ecstatic samadhi. Simply by observing your behaviors, you can understand things about your behaviors, right? You can sit and observe other people and understand things about them. And that's a certain part of comprehension. 
But the more you can separate from your ego, the stronger the comprehension will be. The more you can extract your consciousness from its cage, from the ego, the more your comprehension can penetrate. Samadhi in itself is produced by the union of shamatha and vipassana, by the union of mental stability and analytical meditation. So when we have a stable mind, we analyze an ego, we're analyzing our experience from the day in retrospection, we're unifying shamatha and vipassana. And in that, samadhi can emerge. And that samadhi can have many levels, many depths, many heights. It doesn't have to be a super profound thing. You may just have a samadhi where you gain a quick vision, a quick insight, some images, or a sound. Very simple, but that is samadhi. Right. The Master Samael indicated that we need to grasp the deep significance of an ego. And this is relative to the samadhi, the degree of comprehension that we can acquire. Meditating on an ego, we may receive a certain image or a a memory or a sound or a quality that emerges from that in our meditation. And that is, in its essence, a form of samadhi because we're retrieving information. We're retrieving understanding. But when we can penetrate deeper and find the roots we can find the cause of that ego, the cause of that suffering, then we can start to grasp the deep significance of it. And that's when that ego can be killed. That's when that ego can die. And that only can come from samadhi. Because it's only in that deep penetrating awareness or awakened consciousness free of ego that we can perceive that depth. So it's a mistake, to repeat, it is a mistake to say, that only with deep comprehension we can work on the ego. No. You can work on the ego now. But to fully eliminate and kill the ego, yes. You need to comprehend it deeply. But, you know, remember again, different egos have different depths. Some are shallow and easy. Some are deep, very difficult to root out. This is why meditation is so important. We can penetrate our mind relative to the power of our meditation. So if our meditation is shallow and superficial, that's as far as we can reach in our mind. So keep developing. Keep feeding that tree so that it will become very powerful. Another question? Does the and the have any relation to dhyana? Yeah. Dhyani bodhisattva is a term that relates to our innermost Uh, the Master Samael states that when the Logos emanates from himself, his representative, that representative is the innermost, who is his head. That is the Dhyani Bodhisattva of that Logos. Dhyana is the technique that we use to reach the wisdom of the innermost. Stated another way, through Dhyana, Meditation, concentration. We unite our willpower with buddhi, gebra, vipassana, insight, consciousness. And when those two unite, what is revealed is the wisdom, the prana of chesed, atman, the dhyani. So there is definitely a link. Any other questions? Yes. Um, as you meditate and uh, you, you find it harder to, to be to concentrate on something as like your, your session goes on, is, is that something that you should sort of work through, or is that like an, an indication that you should uh, like limit the time that you meditate? This is a very good question. We have to apply effort in a balanced way, in a prudent way. For example, if you're sitting to meditate and it's becoming increasingly difficult to concentrate, you should take a break. You shouldn't push so hard that you burn yourself out and become disillusioned. So it's better in that case to break up your session into smaller pieces. Meditate for 10 or 15 minutes, and when you start to notice that 
frustration and the difficulty become too much, stop. Take a break, take a walk, get some air. Maybe you go do other things for a while. Observing yourself, continuing to remember yourself, and then come back to your practice and try again. You, you want to point, you want to push to a certain point because you need discipline. We have to, you know, discipline the mind. But we, some of us have the tendency to overdo that, to overexert, and we just burn ourselves out. And you see that with a lot of meditators. They think it's all about willpower, that they just need to sit there and suffer. This is wrong. That's a kind of fakirism, which is thinking that through pure willpower you can force the mind. And this is wrong. You cannot force the mind. What you do is you direct attention and you allow the mind to settle. If it's too crazy, too chaotic, take a break. A very good way to approach meditation for beginners is to meditate in short sessions, but often. So don't think you have to go home today and meditate for an hour or two hours if you're a beginner. This would be harmful. It's better for you to go home and meditate for five or ten minutes and do something else. And then later on, meditate again for five to ten minutes. And do that as many times as you can throughout the day. And what you'll discover is that approach not only gives you comprehension of how to meditate, but it incredibly strengthens your efforts to self-observe. You start to develop continuity of practice very rapidly. As opposed to the person who meditates once a day, let's say late at night, they're already tired, they try to sit for an hour, they exhaust themselves, they get frustrated, and then they don't have any more inspiration. That person will develop their self-observation very slowly and their meditation practice very slowly. And they'll always have that obstacle of frustration. But if you do it in little pieces, often, you can quickly grasp some essential things about how to work with your consciousness. So I find that to be a very effective technique, encouraging technique. Little by little, you'll discover that you start adding time spontaneously because you start to get it. That practice starts to become important to you. It starts to give you something that you need and want. And then it's no longer, oh, I have to meditate, you know, with this sort of despondency. This is a bad attitude and it's harmful. We need to practice in a way where we feel encouraged, where we feel inspired. As if this is something we need, something we want. That's a very good analogy. Meditation should be developed in the way of the way we feel about food when we're hungry. We need it. When you're hungry, you need to eat. Meditation is the same. We need that food, but we don't realize it. And if you learn your practice in the right way, if you develop for yourself the right kind of discipline, you can realize that need and start to feed yourself with that practice. Meditation is the heart and soul of this tradition. To get it, to understand Gnosis, to understand the path of the Bodhisattva, you, you have to meditate. You will never grasp this teaching if you don't understand how to meditate, if you don't practice. It's simply impossible without it. That's why it's the fifth paramita. It's the culmination of the first four paramitas. Culminate in that fifth meditation, which is the ultimate expression of method. And it's through meditation that we reach wisdom. There is no other door. There is no other door. There's no book. There's no teacher, no guru. No one can save us. Only our practice of meditation can lead us to prana. Any other questions? Yes. If you have to maintain whatever level you've gotten to, then what is it about it? Do you really just start over back to the beginning? Not necessarily. Depends. Uh, if you've already developed some mental stability, but you became lazy and lost that, you've already had some comprehension of how to get to that point. And so you can recover that. You know what I'm saying? It's like if you've already learned a skill, re reacquiring it is not so difficult. And this is also true of past existences. Some people in past existences became very 
good meditators, but lost that. And so in this existence, they may, by taking on the practice, intuitively understand many things that another person will struggle with. And it's because previously they have done it. So it's important when we encounter a person like that to not become resentful or envious, but to instead become inspired. If this person is grasping it, if they get it, then I can too, through practice. And likewise, if we've abandoned our practice for some reason or become lazy, it's really up to us to inspire ourselves again and try again. But this time, be more prudent. If we abandoned the practice before, it's because in some way we weren't working in the right way. We did something that was a little harmful to us, so we abandoned it. We didn't get the food we needed. So when you start again, it's very good to totally reevaluate your practice. Don't assume that the things you did before were all correct. If they had been, you wouldn't have abandoned it, right? So it's good to revise your understanding. And you'll find those little things, it could be little subtle things, that somehow corrupted that practice you had and you abandoned. You can turn. You can return to it. It's up to you. You got a question back here? Should we self-observe all day even though it takes a lot of energy? Absolutely yes. This is why in the graphic of the levels of shamatha, we have this big fire at the bottom. And that fire symbolizes how much effort we have to make. We can't be relaxed and easygoing about our self-observation practice in the middle. And unfortunately, some people teach that that we should be very laid back and relaxed about our self-observation practice. This is wrong. Nowhere in the teachings does it say that. In fact, it says quite the opposite. The Master Samael said, it only takes an instant of forgetfulness to fall asleep. And so it takes incredible diligence to remain awake. And that's this fire. In the beginning, self-observation, self-remembering, and meditation are exhausting. If you feel exhausted from that effort, good. It means you're doing it. It means you're doing it. If you feel very sort of relaxed and lackadaisical and laid back, you need to revise your practice. Self-observation in the beginning takes incredible effort. The more energy you put into it, the more effort you put into it, the more you will understand about it. And as you see on this chart, eventually the fire becomes less because eventually your consciousness learns how to self-observe. And then it no longer takes so much whipping and prodding. This is also why the monk has the hook and the rope. Because in the beginning, he has to whip and prod the elephant, which is our mind. But after a while, the elephant becomes tame. As the mind becomes calm, our self-observation emerges naturally, spontaneous, until eventually it becomes natural. And this is what the Master Samael stated many times. For him, self-observation didn't take any effort at all. It was spontaneous. So until we reach that, we need to put in a lot of energy. Yeah. You go to a regular nine to five job and when you come home, you can't just sit and meditate. I mean, it's something to you know, concentrate on, you know, uh, to sedate, the, you know, especially the nervous system. You know. Sure. There are a lot of practices that you can use in order to cultivate the field of your mind before you meditate, to prepare it, right, to prepare the environment. Mantras are a very good use, a very good tool. To vocalize a mantra to perform a pranayama exercise, or to also listen to some classical music very attentively for a brief period. These, all of these things can help you to relax and sharpen your awareness and also prepare your um, psychophysical organism so that the meditation will become effective. And it's true that if you come home from a crazy day at work and immediately try to meditate, your mind will be very agitated. 
So it's better to take a walk, take a bath, listen to some music, vocalize, do some things to relax and help yourself calm down. Really, a very good time to meditate is first thing in the morning, when you first wake up, because the environment around you is already very calm, and your mind will be calm. This is an excellent opportunity to meditate. Even if you only have 10 minutes, use it. Take a few minutes to concentrate yourself and relax and use a mantra. I will teach you a mantra now uh, that's very, very useful. And then I'm going to teach you another one in the next lecture, which is also very useful. The lecture... Um, today is more about developing concentration and stabilizing the mind. The mantra that I'll give you is Om Masi Padmi Yom. This is an ancient mantra. This is the heart mantra of Chinrezi, who in Tibetan Buddhism symbolizes the cosmic Christ. This mantra has six syllables, which relate to the six paramitas. Om, Ma, Si, Pad, Me, Hum, or Yum. You can use this mantra 24 hours a day. Saturate your consciousness with this sound. Not from an external source, but from inside. Constantly repeat and sing and chant this mantra with devotion. And the energies of the mantra can saturate you with a lot of help. It stimulates many things that will benefit you and help you develop your practice. If you vocalize the mantra before you do your Concentration practice, this is also very useful. You can also take this mantra as your concentration practice. But you have to gauge your own abilities. If you don't have enough concentration to sit in mantra and, and concentrate on a mantra quietly for a while, this may not be so easy. So gauge that for yourself. But it's a very powerful technique, whether vocalized or repeated internally. But again, you can use this all day long. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,